Yeah, I've got a question tonight that came up a week or so ago. I, I talked with you about the question that I'd gotten about, about Gog and Magog in Genesis chapter 38 and 39, where prophecy preachers are out there right now because of the, the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and, and the threat that that would be to the rest of, uh, of Europe and, and so forth. And the idea has been among prophecy preachers for, for forever that Russia was going to invade uh, Israel and be, be a part of the, of, of the crowd that works with the Antichrist that invades Israel. And when you see Russia doing these things and the Russia watcher, watchers, and, and it comes out of Ezekiel 38 and 39 where Gog and Magog is, verse 38, 1. The, word, the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog and the land of Magog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, saying, and then he gives you the prophecy. And I, told, I tried to show you two things about this passage. Number one, there's no Russia in the passage at all. The way they get Russia is in verse number, one, verse number two, when it says, uh, Set thy face against Gog and the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach, New Bibles, the, it comes out of the, of the Septuagint. They, instead of translating the chief prince, they say the prince of Rosh, which is the Hebrew word for chief. That word's used over 600 times as an adjective in your Bible, as it is here, and it's never translated Russia. It, in fact, it's not translated Rosh. It's translated chief over and over and over in the Scripture. Yeah, and it, it doesn't appear. So what they have to do first is change your Bible. And then second, in the passage, Gog is the Antichrist. If you look down at verse number 17, Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou, and he's talking to Gog, he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants the prophets of Israel, who pro which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them. And he goes on to describe the, the, the uh, Gog attacking Israel, being destroyed at the second advent by Christ. Everybody knows that, that the one that he's prophesied, verse 17 or the him that I've uh, spoken in time past but my servants the prophets. No, this character isn't somebody who's just, it's not Babylon who's coming up uh, against Israel right here. This is somebody that God's Word has been talking about, not just here, but all through His Word. And so it's pretty easy to read this passage and understand, at least from the, their own down, you're talking about uh, the Antichrist. And so the question was that, that came was, if Gog, in chapter 3, 39, verse 11, is buried... Chapter 39, verse 11. It shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea, and it shall stop the, the noses of the passengers, and there shall, be, there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude, and they shall call it the valley of Hamon Gog. And so Gog is buried. But what happens to the Antichrist? If you look at Revelation chapter number 20, Revelation chapter 20, after the second advent of Christ in chapter 19, chapter 20, verse, and by the way, after the second advent of Christ, verse number 20, Revelation 19, 20, and the beast, that's the Antichrist, was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that were worshipped his image, and they both were cast alive into the lake of fire. Lake, lake of fire burning with brimstone. So if the Antichrist, after the second advent of Christ, is cast into the lake of fire, Gog is buried, then why did I say Gog is the Antichrist, the Antichrist is Gog? Now that was the question that came, and I thought, well, that's not, not the worst question I ever had, but it's, it's kind of an obvious question. You probably can think of the answer to that, can't you? Look with me at Luke 16. Well, now you got me worried you didn't answer the question. I'm looking at me like, I don't know how to answer. That's, why, if Gog in Ezekiel 36 and uh, 38 and 39 is killed and then buried... The Antichrist is killed and then cast in the lake of fire. How can they be the same? I'm going to give you an illustration. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a beggar named Lazarus which laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which <coughs> fell from the rich man's table. 
Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. When they buried him, what did they bury? His body. When in hell he lifted up his eyes, what part of him was that? So when you die, your body goes to the grave and your soul goes to hell in this case. See the difference? When Gog talks about, in Ezekiel, when he talks about Gog being buried, that's his body. When he talks about the Antichrist being put in the lake of fire, that's his soul. In fact, the Antichrist is called the son of perdition. And if you look at Revelation chapter 11, he says he's the, 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 the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. He's already got a, accommodations in, in, down, down there. So there's the, there's the one part of him that went, went one place, another part of him went another. And, and to me, it, it's, it's kind of an easy kind of an answer. It's not that kind of a difficult thing. You can figure that out. Now, if you go back to Ezekiel 39, there's an interesting thing about God being buried. <clears throat> when you come down to the end of chapter 38, there's, you, you had Armageddon, and it's over with. Then in chapter 39, there's an interesting thing that happens after the battle of Armageddon. Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and leave but a sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and I will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. Now, when you, when, when you map out the, the second advent of Christ, it takes about two and a half days for him to get to this point. From the time he comes out of heaven on the white horse, comes down the Mediterranean coast, down in, into Sinai, comes back up the, the eastern side of the, of, of the west, you know, that's east, right? Eastern side of the, of the Jordan River, comes across into Jerusalem. He's, he's destroying and, 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 and uh, the, the, the enemies, the people who've come against Jerusalem and so forth. But when he gets to Jerusalem, and he, he, he goes out from there into to Armageddon. He actually confronts the Antichrist twice. There's a, there's a battle with the Antichrist, and, and he destroys his armies. And then the Antichrist goes back up into his stronghold up, 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 up in uh, Nineveh. And then he comes back for the, for the final thing. That's what he's talking about here. I will turn thee back and lay, lay, uh, leave but a sixth part of thee and will cause thee to come up from the north parts. He's going he's gonna, to defeat him and then bring him back cause him to come and, and will we'll, we'll bring thee upon the mountains of Israel and I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. He's going he's gonna, to uh, uh, disarm them. And thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy, hand, thy, thy bands and the people that, that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beast of the field to be devoured. The, the, the armies that are defeated literally going to have the animals, the birds, come and feast on them. Hold your hand and come back to Revelation 19, because that's what, ha that's what's hap that's what happens right after the second ad advent there. Revelation 19, verse 11, I saw the heaven open. Behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he did judge and make war. And he comes down, verse 13, he's clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. So he goes through, through the wine press of the fierceness of the wrath of God. Uh, verse 14, the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Now re remember these verses, because we're going to look at some other ones like it in a minute. He comes out of heaven. The armies of God had been in heaven with him, Revelation 12. Michael and the armies that go up and they cast Satan and, his, and, his, and his, his cohorts down, they're literally taking back over the heavens. And now he comes down with those armies with him. Verse number 15, he has the, out of his mouth goes a sword, sharp sword, that with it he, he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with, with, a, with a rod of iron, and he treadeth upon the winepress of the fiercest and wrath of Almighty God. Here's, here's the crescendo of God's wrath being poured out. 
And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, and I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls of, of the, that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that, he may, that, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sat on them and the flesh of, of men both free and, and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts of the, of, uh, and the kings of, of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat in the horse and, and against his army. So what's going to happen after Armageddon, after the Christ has completely vanquished them, killed them, then you're going to have this great supper where the, the, the beasts come and eat. That's where you are in Ezekiel. So go back there, Ezekiel 39. That's what's going on here when he talks about the animals, the, 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 the birds coming and taking them. Verse 5, Thou shalt fall upon the open field, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord. And I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell uh, carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord God. So will I make my name known in the midst of, of the people. The reason God's doing this, this destruction, the way he's doing it, is to make his name known, to declare to people, so all the nations of the earth see who, who Jehovah is. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And I will not let them pollute my holy name any more, and the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, it is I, it, 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 it is come and it is done, saith the Lord. This is the day whereof I have spoken. So now the day of the Lord is there. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both of the shields and the bucklers and the bows and the arrows and the, and the hand uh, staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. You know, you watch that stuff going on over in, in, in Kosovo right now. Uh, not Kosovo, what am I talking about? Yeah, I, I'm just saying, where did Kosovo come from? In Ukraine. And they, they keep showing these, these roads full of tanks and armor, armor vehicles, and the wheels are off. And they, they had a thing, I saw this afternoon a thing where they, they had blown up a bunch of cars and, a, and, and evidently blown up a hotel or something, cars in the, in the parking lot, and they just shells. And you know, stuff going to sit there forever, you know. A while ago, when I was coming here this afternoon, right up here on, on 53 at the uh, Algonquin exit, there's a car on fire, smoke everywhere, you could hardly see through it. And, you know, you, you see something, and it just sits there, it's junk now. Well, all this armament that's been in that battle, all the armies of the earth that have come and sent, sent armies there, it's going to take them, they, they're going to burn it, it's going to take seven years to clean up the scene. You think, man, that's, you know, usually you think about God just sort of moving like that. But this, you know, he, he doesn't function like Samantha or like some of that, you know, the, the magic guys. This is real stuff, and the people do this. That's just the, 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 the amount of, of, of uh, uh, carnage that there is left. Now verse 10, So that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any uh, of, the, of the forest, for they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil the, those that spoil the, them, and rob those that rob them, saith the Lord. And it shall come to pass, now verse 11, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog a place there of graves in Israel. And the valley of the passengers on the east uh, uh, of the sea. And it shall, it shall stop the noises, of, of the, stop the nose, noses of, of, of the passengers. And there shall, there shall they bury Gog and all his multitude. And they shall call it the valley of Haman Gog. And seven months shall be the house shall the house of Israel be burying of them that they may cleanse the land notice that they're going to as they gather up all of the carnage from the battle they're going to bury Gog and and, all, and his army 
in a memorial garden. They're literally going to have a memorial park. They're going to name it Haman Gog, the, 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 the multitude of Gog is what that name means. And it's a fascinating thing that they're going to make a, what I would call a, a memorial park. A, a, you know, we have national parks where you have, you know, monuments and so forth and things. And they're literally going to, to take uh, the, the Antichrist's body. His soul's going to be in the lake of fire. But they're going to take him and, 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 and his army and make a, a memorial park out of it. And you say, well, why would they do that? In fact, there are going to be three of these things. In, in the millennium, where people come and, and look, and they're going to come, and the reason the reason they're going to do that, uh, you know, we we make memorials to to celebrate, to remind ourselves of 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 things. Uh, you, you know, you have the Lincoln Memorial, and the Jefferson Memorial, and the Washington Monument, and you have the uh, Second World War Memorial, and the First World War Memorial, and the Vietnam Memorial. Yeah, you, you have memorials to to memorialize victory. And 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 the 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 uh, to remind you about what 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 was happening. And in the kingdom, there are going to be literally three different memorials. This is one of them, where people are going to come. And what they're going to do is verse verse seven. I'm going to do it to make my holy name known. Now, understand when God says that He it's not. I just we had some discussion uh, a few days ago about the verse in Philippians about. Uh, God's given him a name of every name that at the name of Jesus every nation should bow. And people say, well, does that mean the name Jesus isn't going to be his name? Well, it says he gave him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. And Revelation says he, he has a name no man should know. That's not talking about my name is Richard. Some people call me Ricky. Some people call me, well, I shouldn't say all the things people call me. But you got different names. That, that's, not, that's not the idea. When someone will make his name known, it's not just, well, you have these people say, well, they say the Jews wouldn't write Jehovah because it was, they were scared they'd pronounce it wrong. Well, they may have done that. I don't know. But that's not what the Bible's talking about when it does that. Come back with me in Exodus chapter 34. When God talks about making his name known, and when he talks about making my name Jehovah known, he's not talking about being sure everybody says his name correctly. By the way, don't go around saying Yahweh, the Yahweh. The idea of calling Jehovah Yahweh, they take the letters and they say, well, there's no vowels in it, but it should be, and that Hebrew didn't have a J, it had a Y. English has the J. If you're going to say it in English, it's Jehovah. You understand that? You don't say Jerusalem. The guys that say y'all, they don't say, they say Jerusalem. Same first letter. They don't say Yahshua. They, well, they probably do say Yahshua. They don't say Jeremiah. Take any name in, in, in English that starts with a J would start with the same thing that Jehovah started with. And, but they don't do that for those names. The reason for that is a bunch of German rationalists in the middle of 1800s decided this is what we ought to do, and they can't, they, they can't say J, so they say Y. And it's just, it's stupid. It's got nothing to do with it except make you think you know something smart. I know how to say God's name. What it's talking about his name, it has nothing. To, when you talk about God's name, you talk about who he is. When I make my name known, I want people to understand who I am. Not just how to, you know, call me by the right denominator in exodus 33 paul, uh, paul moses says to god let show me thy presence show me thy glory i want to see your glory and so the lord says okay i'll show you my glory in chapter 33 chapter 34 the lord comes to show him 34 verse 5 the lord descended in a cloud in the cloud and by the way when he says show me thy glory Here's how, God, here's how he shows him his glory. So if you really want to know what the glory of God is, it isn't just this bright light. That's what it's represented. But it's the understanding of who he is. When you appreciate who he is, you see the glory, the value, the excellency of who he is. 34 verse 5. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood before him, that's Moses there, 
and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So here's what you do when you proclaim the name of the Lord. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. I'm six foot five, my hair's burnt. No, that's not what he did. He didn't proclaim, my name is spelled J-E. No, he, he doesn't do that. He tells him who he is. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God. Now that's Jehovah, Jehovah Elohim. Who is he? Merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sins, and that will by no means clear the guilty. You see those things? Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, goodness, truth, forgiveness, justice. That's who he is. When you proclaim the name of the Lord, you say, you know, you know who God is? He's merciful. He's gracious. He's long-suffering. Isaiah, 1 John says, God is love. You know who God is? You know the thing that characterizes him above all things, other, everything else? Love. 1 John, he says, God is light. There's, in him there's no darkness at all. So if you want to know who God is, that's who he is. Well, when he says, oh, we're going to proclaim the name of the Lord, he's going to claim, proclaim a specific thing about the Lord. You see where he says, now we love the mercy, the graciousness, the long-suffering, the goodness, the truth, forgiveness. But then he says, and will by no means clear the guilty. That's justice. There's a big debate going on in our era about, right now, it's a big thing on the Internet, about what's called penal atonement. That is that Jesus Christ, when he died for your sins, did he really suffer the wrath of God against sin? Or was it just something else? And there's a whole group of people now that are saying it's something else. Guy like N.T. Wright and those kind of guys, they're, they're, number one, they don't have a Bible. Number two, they're preterists. They don't understand, they don't take the Bible to have literally. Number three, well, he's a New Testament era scholar. He's trying to take you, well, you need to go back to the first century and think like a first century guy thought. How in the world are you going to do that? You have trouble enough thinking like a 20th century person thinks. See, so where do you got to go to figure out how a first century guy thinks? You got to go to him. So everybody's following him. But the idea there is you shouldn't say that God is an angry, vengeful God. I, don't, I wouldn't say that. God's not angry, vengeful. He's just. And he doesn't clear the guilty. He calls debt into, in, in, into accountability. So who is God? He's all those things. But there's one thing you need to remember about he also doesn't clear the guilty. He's just. And what this thing's going to do demonstrate is who was the Antichrist? He's the lie. The lie program. Here's a, mon a memorial that every time those Gentiles go up to Jerusalem to worship, and come with me to Zechariah chapter 14 and notice they're going to do this. When the, when the nations of the earth go up, to worship. They're going to they're gonna be able to go out. I've got some friends that are, that are uh, great with a motor home, and they, they go to national parks, and then they send out pictures of everywhere they've been. And it's fascinating to see all these national parks. I was in the Philippines, and the largest American military burial ground outside of our country is in the Philippines, World War II veterans, soldiers that were died. And there's a, there's a beautiful monument, monu mammoth monument there to the bravery and the gallant and the sacrifice of those people. This is going to be a, a, a memorial built to the, declare the justice of God. What's right, truth, prevails over the lie. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. And it's come to pass, and this is, you see verse number 9, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Verse 4, 
and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. He's come back. The angels in Acts 1 says you, they're on the Mount of Olives. So the same Jesus used to go with, and like Mount of come back. His feet, he leaves the Mount of Olives. At the second advent, eventually he comes back and he stands, first time he hits the ground, so Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14 is talking about that. Verse number 9, he's the king. Now, what's happening in the kingdom? Verse 16, it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations that came up against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year and worship the king, the Lord of hosts, to keep the feast of tabernacles. And then he talks about the, what happens to the nations that don't go. My point is that in the kingdom, the nations are going to come and do the pilgrimage up there. And when they come, there are going to be some places that they can go and visit in Jerusalem that memorialize what the Messiah has done. And that memorial, Haman Goth, Gog, is a memorial that demonstrates the name of God, proclaims his name, makes his name holy. And you see, that's what he does in 39, verse 7. I will make my holy name known. I'm the Holy One of Israel. And so you're going to have this memorial that demonstrates this is what happens to the lie program, the satanic policy of evil, and this is what happens to the truth. And there's going to be a memorial to that, to, to, the, to the absolute victory that's been accomplished. Now come over to Isaiah chapter 66, because there, there, there's some other ones. And these other two, Isaiah, get Isaiah 66 in one hand, and Isaiah 34. These are not the only ones that have been in the millennium. The, these, these three are, are quite fascinating. Isaiah 66, verse number 22. For as in the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, they, sh they, they, remain, they shall remain before me, saith the Lord. So shall your seed and your, na uh, your name remain, talking to Israel. And it shall come to pass, by the way, you notice how in verse number 22 it says, as, for as in the new heavens, plural, and new earth. This is not Revelation 21 with the new heavens, singular, and new earth. This is in the millennium where the heavens, plural, are still there. They, they're done away with in the new heaven and earth. But you're sti th this is going to be in the millennial kingdom. It shall come to pass, verse 23, that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth, after they've worshipped, and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, and their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Now, if by that passage you write down Mark chapter number 3, Mark chapter number 9, verse 44, 45, 46, 47, you'll see where Jesus Christ quotes that passage in reference to people in hell. So what they're doing is they're worshiping and they're coming out This, this location is, come with me in Isaiah chapter 34, it's located south of the Dead Sea. In Zechariah 14, the, that topography of the, of, of, of the land there is all changed. The Dead Sea is raised and so forth. But south of the Dead Sea, where Edom, the, the, the territory of Edomia, in Isaiah chapter 34, this is where that place is going to be, where they're going to be able to look at lost people's souls in hell and see the ultimate consequence, the ultimate result of sin. Isaiah 34. Now this is a passage about the second advent. Come near ye nations to hear and hearken ye people. Let the earth hear and all that there is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations and his fury upon all their armies. And he shall utterly destroy them, and he, uh, them. he hath delivered them to the slaughter. Verse number 5. And my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Edomia. 
he's, the armies are in heaven, and then they're going to come down. And this passage is talking to me about when they come down to the land of Idumea. Now, they're going to come a lot of other places, but this is specifically about the land of Idumea. And upon the people of my curse to judgment. Verse five, 6, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness, and with the blood of lambs and of goats and the, uh, the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Bozrah, and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. Now that, again, that land is down south of the Dead Sea. And the unicorns shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust shall be fat with fatness. Now Isaiah chapter 63 talks about the Lord coming up from Edom, coming up from this territory. And he says, he's dyed, his garments are dyed red. And he says, why, why, are you, why, why is everything red? He said, I've been treading the winepress of the fiercest and wrath of Almighty God. That's what, so verse 8, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of the recompense, uh, recompenses uh, uh, for the controversy of Zion. And the streams thereof of the land shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. For the generation, from generation to generation, it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. So that land's going to literally turn into pitch, and the fire that Christ that comes out of his mouth at, at this time is going to set it on fire. If you hold hand here and come over with it, Deuteronomy 32. Another passage that talks about these events. I just look at verse 22. Deuteronomy 32, 22. The fire... For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and it shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. This fire that comes out at the second advent focuses on that, that piece of ground right there and literally burns the earth out of the shaft that goes down into, into hell. Look over with me, if you will, the book of Nahum. Now, where is Nahum? When you find Nahum, say hello. <laughs> Nobody knows where Nahum is. Nahum's a minor prophet, of course. It's on page 906, 952 if you've got the right Bible. Nahum, verse, chapter 1, verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. Now we're back like in, 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 in uh, Exodus 33, 34. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust, uh, dust of his feet. He rebuked the sea and maketh it dry. He drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth in Carmel, and the flower of, Eben, of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at, his, at, at, at him, and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who shall stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Now you're going down. My point to you, verse 5, the earth melts. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but if, if someone goes to hell, rich man died, is in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Where, how do you get there? Hell's in the heart of the earth, according to the verses. Jesus says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. So hell is a place. It's got gates and bars. He said, I've got the key to hell. So it's got a glock and it's got a key. There's, Either this stuff is real or it isn't. If it is real, it's in the spirit world. It's not the physical world we're in, but it's in the, in the world where your soul would live. It's a prison. There's a, there has to be a place, a way to get in it. 
And in the, in, in the Middle East, there are at least two different sh shafts, I'd call them, that go down from the surface of the planet into the nether world. One of them is there below the, the Dead Sea. And what, what he does at the second advent is he literally burns out the rock and earth that fill it up and open it up. And then you're able to look down into it and see the things that are there. There's going to be a memorial park. Come back to Exodus 30, chapter 30. It has a name. And it's going to be a memorial, this place of fire. By the way, the fire starts here and comes with the second heaven. Isaiah chapter 30, 30, behold, verse number 27. Behold, the name of the Lord cometh from, a, from far, burning with his anger. Again, this is talking about the second advent. And, 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 and burning with his anger, and the burden thereof is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, and his tongue, Isaiah 30, verse 27. What did I say? Exodus. Exodus. We left Exodus a long time ago. <laughs> Sometimes I don't know what I say. My wife says I don't pay attention to what I say. Isaiah 30, verse 27. Behold, the, the name of the Lord cometh from far. He personifies his presence. Burning with his anger. Why? Because he doesn't clear the guilty. He's just. And the guilty need to be held accountable. You don't just fluff it off burning with his anger, and the burden thereof is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, and his tongue as a devouring fire. His breath as an overflowing stream shall reach to the midst of the neck to sift the nations. And he goes on down to verse 30. The Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard. You remember Second Thessalonians, he says he'll destroy him with the brightness of his power. I mean, his, his thing, Revelation said his voice is like his word, because the sword goes out of his mouth. The Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard and shall show the lightning down his arm with the indignation of his anger, with the flame of the devouring fire, and with scattering and tempest and hailstone. For through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrian, the Antichrist, be beaten down with smoke with the rod. And every place where the, where the ground staff has been pressed, he's going to come, verse 33, for Topet. Now that's the name. He is ordained of old. Yea, for the king. It is prepared. He hath made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. Now that place, Topet, is that's the name of the park. And the idea there, Topet is, is Hebrew means the place of fire. In Mark chapter 9, when Christ quotes Isaiah 66, the word there that's translated hell is not Hades, Hades, it's Gehenna. Now you've heard that word. People say, well, it's Gehenna is not hell, hell is not Gehenna. Hades and Gehenna, it's, 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 Gehenna is the word the, the way a Greek would say what Topet's referring to. And they'll tell you that, that, that what it is is that uh, it's the place of fire, it's the, it's the garbage dump. Well, you know, the stuff says garbage always burning. That's right. Hell, Topet, the lake of fire is going to be the garbage dump of the universe. Those different names, Revelation chapter 20, you remember this about hell. Revelation 20 at the great white throne says, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Hell is where, is where people, lost people go today. The lake of fire is where hell is gone forever and ever. They're not the same, but they're, one is the holding tank until after the sentencing, the other is the, the big house. But the monu during the millennium, people are literally going to go, they'll be able to go and they'll look 
there at, at south of, uh, of the Dead Sea there, south of Jeru uh, uh, Jerusalem, south of the Dead Sea, and there's going to be a monument. Jesus said, if your hand offended, cut it off. It's better to go through life main than to be cast into hell. It's going to be the place where people, when they're found guilty in the kingdom, and Isaiah 60, uh, 60 talks about a child. Man, the person that dies as a hundred be considered a child. People live a thousand years. If you die at a hundred, you, 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 you're just a baby. But why would you die in the millennium? There's no reason to die except you're a rebel. And when people sin, they just literally take them right up there and um, instant execution. Why could there be instant execution? He judges with a rod of iron. He's the king. He's the judge. I said to you, when you talk about government in the kingdom, you're not going to have a democracy. You're not going to have a representative republic. You're going to have a monarchy. That's interesting. You'll have a benevolent monarchy because the king will be a king of righteousness. And only righteousness and goodness prevail. But there won't be a crime problem because of instant execution. Sentence against an evil work, the Bible says, when sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, the hearts of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. But is it, Brother Rick, you think capital punishment is a deterrent to crime? The guy won't ever do it again. Okay? But if you make it 30 years from now, it doesn't deter anything. It's useless, and you ought to quit. But if you have execution against an evil work done speedily, justly, and the reason in our society you have to be so long with it is because you can't, you can't trust any of the government systems that prosecute people to be sure that they're, they're actually guilty. But when somebody is guilty, and you know they are, you shouldn't wait 30 years. But when you do... If sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, the hearts of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. Ecclesiastes 8.11. So that tells you something. In the kingdom, like that. And there'll be a place to go to see where you see that sin doesn't pay off. Not only does the lie program not work, your sin doesn't work either. So you'll have a memorial for that. Then the time's almost gone. Look at Isaiah chapter 13. This one is kind of fun. Th th those two are kind of serious. But you know, when you, when you take kids to parks, one of the things you like to do is go to the zoo. Maybe you don't like the zoo, but your kids do. And I said chapter 13, once again, we're in a context of the day of the Lord. Verse, thir verse 6, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is, is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. And he, go he goes down through and talks about uh, verse 11, I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the, the arrogance of the proud to, to cease. He's going to come in his advent, in the second advent, and going to destroy uh, the, the ungodly. and his wrath is going to be poured out. Uh, verse 13, I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall uh, remove out of, out of its place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of, the fierce, of his fierce anger. So he's talking about Christ's return. Verse 17, he's talking, well, let's you do verse 19. Verse 19 is going to talk about the destruction of Babylon. Now, Babylon, mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Babylon is, a, you go back to Genesis 11, that was the headquarters of, uh, 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 of Nimrod and his plan, satanic plan, to go out and usurp the government of the planet and make the world worship him. Produce a one world government with one world language under his control. With one world religion. So Babylon in your Bible, like Assyria, is, is, is not just a place. It's a, it's, a, it's a place that is a representative of the collection of, 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 sa of satanic evil. Well, what does following the satanic religion get you? What does it turn you into? Verse 19, In Babylon, the glory of, of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans, excellent Ex excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, what did he do to Sodom and Gomorrah? <laughs> Rain down fire on it. Remember that. It shall never be inhabited. Now, this passage has never been fulfilled. First Peter chapter 5, Peter talks about being in Babylon. 
So when, when, when Nebuchadnezzar fell, the media Persians came and took this passage wasn't fulfilled. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it, be, shall it be, be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their, their foal there. But the wild beast of the desert shall lie there. So people aren't going to be there, but they're going to be a bunch of animal, deep beast. And their, house, their houses shall be full of doleful creatures and owls shall dwell there and satyrs shall dance there and the wild beast of the of the of the islands shall cry in the desolate in their desolate desolate uh, houses it's going to be scary screams and noises and dragons in their in their in their pleasant places and her time is near to come and her days shall be prolonged so you can have all these weird creatures and we see what it says satyrs now, people immediately say, well, see, your Bible is, not, is wrong. That's a mythological creature. They do that with unicorns, too. Look over, back over at chapter 34. When that memorial in chapter 34 takes place, look at verse number 11. But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it, and the owl also and the raven shall shall dwell in it, and he shall, he, that he shall stretch out upon it a line of confusion and the stones of emptiness, and they shall call the nobles there, thereof to the kingdom, but none shall, shall, uh, none shall be there, and all her princes shall be nothing, and thorns shall come up in, their, in her palace, nettles, brambles, the fortress thereof, and it shall be a habitation of dragons and a court of owls, the wild beasts of the desert, shall also meet with the wild beast of the island, and the satyrs shall cry, the satyrs shall cry to his fellow, and the screech owl, you know, verse 15, you say, what in the world is all that? Well, come over with me to Revelation chapter number 9. Because what you see, you have to understand, when you talk about hell, and even the lake of fire, the issue isn't the lake of fire, and the issue isn't fire in the sense of burning something else, because it doesn't, the fire doesn't consume anybody. The burning, it goes back to Ezekiel chapter, 30, chapter 28, when there's a fire consumed in, in Lucifer when he became Satan. You, you know the, the verse in Corinthians says, if, if you burn in lust, you don't think you're going to combust into fire there's a burning there's a yearn, there's a there's a, a, a yearning for something that you don't have that you want and you want it so bad it's like a burning in your bosom that's the that's i'm not saying the fire we're talking about it real it's that's what the fire is about and what happens with sin does sin lift you up or does it pull you down did you there's a degeneration, and the degenerative impact of sin upon a person's soul is demonstrated. Revelation chapter 9, verse number 2, And I saw the, uh, the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And they, 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 those angels come along, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 8. I mean chapter 9. Revelation 9. The fifth angel sounded, and, and I saw a star fall from heaven in, under the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. So now you're down in one of the, one of the compartments of, of, of hell. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of, of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the, of the smoke locusts upon the earth and upon them that were given power, and under them were given power as the scorpions of the earth. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any, any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which had not 
the seal of God in their forehead. And to them was given that they should not, not kill them, but that they, they should be tormented by fire, I'm, I'm tormented five months, I'm sorry, and they tormented, their, their torment was as the torment of scorpions, a scorpion when, when he striketh a man. And those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall fear, desire to die, and, and death shall flee from them. Now watch verse 7. And the shapes of the locusts, that's these spirit creatures coming out of the bottomless pit, were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and their heads were as it were crowns of gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as their as the hair of women, and their feet were as the feet of lions, and they had the breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many. You read through that stuff, you say, if you tried to draw that, what in the world would you draw? What are these creatures? I mean, they're a combination of a horse, a man, a woman, a lion, a scorpion. I mean, they are these weird-looking strange bodies that are being described back then in Isaiah 13. So when you read about a satyr, listen, that is, there is a degenerative process in the angelic creation. These dudes in the bottomless pit. Sin degenerates. There's going to be a monument in the land of Palestine, one to the absolute total victory of truth over the lie program. Another one that demonstrates the, the, uh, the result of sin. What does sin get? It gets total destruction. And one, the impact in the spirit world of what the degenerative process of sin. The, the demonic zoo of, of these miserable creatures who are experiencing the degenerative process of sin. So in Ezekiel 39, with the, the monument of Haman Gog, that is, is the monument to, to the, the, the victory, the total victory, the total avengement that God has of the truth against the lie, of justice proclaiming his name, is not the only memorial. So the reason he physically buried the Antichrist is because there is going to be a monument to the fact that the lie doesn't win, but truth does. And they're going to proclaim the name of the Lord, the holiness of the Lord God. The other monuments have to do with the other programs. So when you get in the millennium, I've often joked that when, when the millennium come, kingdom comes, I'm going to ask the Lord for 400 years of R&R, &R, and I, I want to visit some of these monuments. Now, I'm joking. You understand? I'm, I'm kidding, but there's a reality to that. And it'll be, a, it'll, be a test, it'll be another testimony to the Gentile nations. You, you deal with Gentiles, in, in the Bible, Gentiles are dealt with, with, with as children. So they have the physical things that point to and say, there it is, there it is, there it is. See, that's what happens when you do that's what you happen. That's what happens when you follow the devil, follow Satan's plan of evil. What happens at the end of the millennium? He's let out. Some of them follow him. Don't get the idea. Here's what sin will do to you. If you want to live in sin, here's what happens to you. And here's what happens to all those that follow the adversary. Okay? Anyway. That was interesting to me anyway. So I wrote the guy back. I, said, I didn't tell him all that. Okay? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you most of all for our, your son, our Savior. That he was willing to make a difference and make a difference by stepping out of heaven into our humanity, going to the cross and condemning sin in his flesh through his death and then giving life in its place through his resurrection. 
We thank you for that. We thank you it's a gift that we have from you, from your love. And we just pray we'd, we'd, we'd value it and appreciate it the way you designed it to. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, praise the Lord.